All right, keep your finger in uh, Ephesians chapter 5. We're coming right back to that. If you want to flip over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I just want to point out a verse this morning in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Before I even get started, I just want to make sure that you understand the spirit in which this sermon, this message is going to be preached. Because it is a subject that people will get upset about, especially in the day that we live in today. And my goal is not to upset people or make them angry. It's not my goal. It's not the objective. My objective is to teach the Word of God, teach all of the Word of God, teach it very plainly that, you know, I love these words, hopefully you do too. But oftentimes these words are going to point out areas where we're in error, where we're wrong. And we, want to, we, we should want to fix that. We should want to correct those areas. We should want to get right with God. And I know we live in a sinful flesh and it's not always easy. But what's really important, especially when you come to church and especially when you're reading the Bible, is that you come with the right heart, the right attitude, the right mindset, ready to receive the Word of God and say, you know what, if this steps on my toes, if this, if this applies to me, then I'm just going to receive it and figure out how I could work on this to improve and to get a little bit better and to be a little bit more conformed unto the image of the Father, Son, unto Jesus Christ. That's our goal. That's what we want to do. We want to be able to live better. So this isn't, um, you know, and if, and if any sermon I preach ever applies to you, it doesn't mean I hate you or don't like you or anything like that. This isn't personal. This is just the Word of God. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 13, the Bible says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the Word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now if I'm up here preaching my own opinions, you can have whatever reaction you want. And if it's just my own words then whatever. I don't care if you, if you don't receive that. But what I'm planning on doing today is preaching the Word of God and not adding opinion, but expounding on it just to make sure it's very clear. Because I think the Word of God is pretty clear already, but we're going to go through this. Go back to Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to look at the words and we're going to look at them carefully. We're going to see what the Bible actually says. And the subject that I'm dealing with this morning, I'm, uh, the title of my sermon is Biblical Marriage. Biblical Marriage. And Ephesians 5 is probably one of the best passages to turn to if you want to understand what a biblical marriage should be according to God's Word. And this is going to step on toes today because we live in a society or in a culture that scoffs at what the Bible says about marriage. It'd be very blunt. You know, the Bible teaches, and we're going to see this, that the man, the husband, is the head of the household and is the one in charge at home. There's one boss that, that ultimately is able to give the rules within the household, and that is given to the husband in the home. And we're going to see that. We're going to see what the Bible says about this, and that the wife is supposed to be in submission to the husband. It's very clear it's all throughout Scripture, okay? But we live in a society, like I said, where young girls are being brought up and taught and raised to be in the position where they're making all the decisions, they're leading their life. You know, you don't need to listen to anyone else. You don't need some man telling you what to do. You, don't, you know, this is the mindset and the attitude that's being pumped into women and children today that, that that's the way that you ought to live. And it's women's liberation and everything else. This is why it's going to step on toes. But let's just come to Scripture with an open heart and say, you know what? I want to have a happy marriage. I want to be right with God. I want to do things the way that the Bible says to do them. That's right. And let's just take the Scripture for what it says. Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to start reading here in verse number 22. The Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Right off the bat, that's a pretty bold, a pretty strong statement that's coming out of the Word of God. This isn't just the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul didn't have an axe to grind with women. Okay, this is, if you're, if you're here this morning, you believe the Bible is the Word of God, 
This isn't just some man speaking. This is the Holy Ghost. Okay, and I, don't, I haven't even added anything to that. I just said that it's bold. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. What does that mean? When you're in submission, it means you're allowing them to make the rules or to, to tell you to do things and you do them. That's what it means to be, to be submitting. You're allowing that person to, to have the authority. And it doesn't just say submit yourselves unto your own husbands. It says as unto the Lord. So the way, how much should a wife be submitting herself to her husband? Well, how much should you be submitting yourself unto the Lord? That's how much. Because that's what the scripture says right here. Now, it's important to note that there is a hierarchy of authority in our lives, in everybody's lives. God is always at the top. So whether there's family authority, whether there's government authority, no matter any other authority that exists in the world, God reigns supreme and the word of God reigns supreme over everybody. That is the authority that you cannot get around, that you cannot go beyond. Any other authority that's established, because the Bible establishes government authority, the Bible establishes family authority, Neither one of those should be coming into conflict with God's authority, with God's laws, with God's rules. So obviously, there is a limit to the husband's authority at home. If your husband tells you to go kill somebody, I know it's silly and ridiculous, but you don't go kill somebody because you say, well, I'm under the authority of my husband. It stops when the husband is, is getting you to break one of God's rules, one of God's commandments, right? Thou shalt not kill. Right. Okay, the, that's very clear. So you need to say, well, I'm going to obey God rather than men. But the point that's being illustrated here is that essentially the, the wife is supposed to take on a role of being submissive to her husband the same way that we ought to be submissive unto the Lord. And I'm not, we're not going to go into all the crazy what-if situations Right? You could use your own common sense on that, but that doesn't negate what the Bible's saying here and the attitude that wives ought to have at home. Let's keep reading. Verse number 23 He's going to explain this even further. For the husband is the head of the wife. The head meaning the boss, the one in charge. Right? That's what your head is. My head at work is my boss, my authority. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So is Christ the head of the church? I think so. I think there's plenty of passages that talk about that. There's many members in one body, and you know who's the head? Christ is the head. The pastor's not the head. He shouldn't be. In some churches, maybe the pastor is the head, where the pastor is just giving his own opinions, his own thoughts, his own whatever, and not going to the authority of the Scripture. But in this church, Christ is the head. And as Christ is the head of the church, the husband is the head of the wife. It says here, and he is the savior of the body. Verse 24, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. In some things, oh, and only this matter or that matter. No, it says in everything. We've just read three verses. They all sound about the same, don't they? It's reiterating the same concept to drive home this point to make sure that it's clear and that it's understood and that this isn't just, oh, you're just misinterpreting that. Oh, you do, that's not exactly what they meant. Oh, he's using hyperbole. Look, three times. He's, he's, he, this, is, this is reiterated what the authority structure is and, and how wives ought to have this attitude. Like I said, this goes against the grain today. Some people may not like it. A lot of people don't like it. I love it. And it's not because, oh, you're a man and you get to tell your wife. No. It's because it's from God. It's God's word. It's the way that God created us. God made men and women to be different creatures, to have different roles, to have different responsibilities. God is not telling women that they're not valuable by putting them in a position. Any more than, does that mean that I'm not valuable because I have a boss at my other job? At work, does that mean I just, well, you have no value then. I can't believe your boss is putting you down like that. You should be the boss too. Well, well no, I shouldn't be the boss too. There's one boss at my work and, and that's the way things operate. Right. 
You know, it, I mean, when you, anytime you, have, you start having multiple bosses, you're going to have, what, what happens when you have conflict? What happens if it's 50-50 on everything? And then there's a disagreement. You know, people want to say it's 50-50 in the home. You have a husband and wife. It's 50-50. 50-50 on everything. Well, where's the tiebreaker? What do you do? How do you function as a family? Husband says, no, nope, we're going to do this. Wife says, no, nope, we're going to do this. If everything is just completely equal as far as authority goes, how do you ever get anywhere? That just sounds like a lot of fighting. Now, notice it doesn't say submit to your husbands when they're right. Doesn't say that. Only, only when he's got it right. Well, anytime you disagree with him, then that doesn't just give you the right to usurp the authority. No, I disagree. I've disagreed with bosses over the years, the jobs I've had. I don't know how many times, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if my way is better. It doesn't matter if I think my way is better. What matters is what did my boss tell me to do? That's what I'm supposed to do. And, and at the end of the day, that's the bottom line. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't entreat your boss, right? And talk to them and say, hey, I've got this other idea. Why don't we do things this way? And I've had bosses, they've been great bosses, and they listen. And they'll take it into consideration. But it still doesn't change the authority. And that's the key thing. Now, not every husband is going to be a good husband. But the Bible doesn't separate only the good husbands. Only the husbands that are doing their job, that's who you need to submit yourself and listen to. And we're going to get into that a little bit later too because there's other passages in Scripture that go into that a little bit more detail. Let's look at the way, let's continue to look at the way the Bible says that, that a biblical marriage looks like. So that's the wives. Those three verses are all geared towards the wives. And it all just revolves around submitting yourself to the authority, the head, which is the husband. Verse 25. Now we're going to get on the husbands. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So now we have another relation here. Say, husband, you need to love your wives. Say, yeah, yeah, I love my wife. Yeah, yeah, whatever, I love my wife. It says, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. For it. So the amount of love that a husband ought to have for his wife is willing to die for his wife. And when you have that, tie, that level of love for your own wife, I mean, you're willing to sacrifice of yourself. You're willing to give of yourself. And hey, if there's anything bad that can happen, it's going to happen to me, not to my wife. That's the attitude. That's the love that a husband ought to have. And if you're loving your wife that way, then ladies, it's going to be easier for the ladies to be in their role of being more submissive when they can see how much you love them. It makes it easy. See, when, and it goes both ways. When the woman is being more submissive, it makes it easier on the husband to just have that love for their wife. And when the husband has that level of love for his wife, it makes it easier for the woman to be able to submit to that because you're going to grow together that much closer when, when you have this type of relationship going on. I don't care. I mean, look, I'm 42 years old. I've been married for a while and I've known plenty of other people. And I've talked to people and I've seen things happen. Almost every fight in marriages, many of them you have to do with either money or she doesn't respect me, he doesn't love me. At the end of the day, that's what it boils down to. Well, I say we need to do this. She doesn't respect me. I don't, she's not... He doesn't love me. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't spend time with me. He's not, you know, this is, this is what goes on in marriages all the time. Which is already spelled out for us in the Bible of how we, how we ought to be. If you want to have a good marriage, we should be following these rules. Let's keep going on here about husbands. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish now this is interesting because this is referring to the, the same way that christ loves the church not only did he give himself for it but why did he give himself for it because he wants to cleanse the church he wants the church to be sanctified cleansed not having spot or wrinkle basically perfecting the church 
Christ wants to have his church, you know, without sin, without any problems, without any wrinkles, without any spots, without any blemishes. That's the way that Christ wants his church presented to him. Well, this is the same amount of love and the same type of love also that men, you know, husbands ought to have for your wife. You ought to care for your wife, care about her spiritual well-being, care about her physical well-being, care, care about the blemishes and the spots and anything else that she might have. You might be able to present your wife to yourself as, as without spot, without wrinkle. And, and, and that's going to take investing of time and thought and care into your wife. That, that you cannot have it any other way. So, you know, yeah, husbands, that you have a lot of work to do. I understand what it's like to work a lot, to have jobs, to, to have other obligations going on, right? Multiple jobs, maybe. That doesn't negate how important it is for your marriage, for you to love your wife and to care about her and to be able to spend time with her and not just blow it off. See, guys aren't quite as emotional as women are, but women need that emotional support. But see, men are always very business-minded and, and thinking on those terms, which is why they want to be respected. When you say things, you just don't want it to, to just be blown off. This is the way God made men and women, and this is the way that God made them to operate if you want to have a successful marriage. So let's keep reading here. Verse number 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Again, it's, it's, it's a very clear way of saying that's how much you ought to be loving your wife. How much do you love yourself? Well, you need to be loving your wife that much, at least. Verse 29, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. So we're getting a pretty equal distribution in the amount of verses and what's being stated here for the wives as well as for the husbands. And it boils down to two things. Wives, be submissive. Be in obedience to your own husband. And husbands, love your wives. And in no uncertain terms, he's saying how much you need to do that. You need to do that as much as Christ. Either be in submission as much to Christ or have as much love as Christ had. That's the goal. That's the mark. That's what we ought to be striving for. And look, everybody is going to fall a little bit short. of That's why, you know, as you love your wife, you, know, you ought to have tenderness and mercy and forgiveness like Christ has mercy and forgiveness for the church. And don't expect and demand perfection out of your wife and just be flying off the handle or whatever, all upset if your wife falls short. Look, Christ had love and mercy, and we need to have that towards our wives as well. Now, it's good to have high standards. I believe in high standards. I think, you know, the Bible should dictate our high standards. We ought to be striving for that. But at the same time, you know, just because you're in authority doesn't mean you have to be this you know, evil dictator. That, and that's, that's the, what the world's going to conjure up and say, oh, well, if the husband's at the household, that means he's going to be like Adolf Hitler. No. <laughs> Look, just because, just because you can have authority doesn't mean you're going to just be an awful person. Especially if you love your spouse. I mean, so think about it this way. Am I the dictator in my house? Yes, I am. Dictator meaning if I dictate something, if I say something, then that's the way it's going to be. Because I have the authority. Does that mean that I'm just forcing my wife and kids to just do horrible things? Of course not. I'm running the house. I'm running things as the person in charge. But I love my wife. I love my kids. I want what's best for them. Sometimes there's disagreement. Sometimes the way that I want to do things isn't the way that my wife wants to do things. But at the end of the day, I'm the one that's in charge. So there shouldn't have to be big fights about it because that's where the authority lays. And, and when, when the wife starts to understand and feel more, well, my husband really does love me and recognize all the things that your husband does for you, it's easier then to accept, okay, I don't think he's right about this, but I'm going to do it anyways because I know that he cares about me. I know that he loves me. And that's the way that, you know, a marriage ought to work. But let's keep reading here because we're going to see things reiterated in the Bible. We're almost done here in Ephesians 5. 
The Bible says, verse 30, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is the way that a marriage works, and, and that's the way that a man definitely needs to be viewing this. That's why the Bible says that, you know, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, because when you join together in marriage, you become one flesh. You're one person. So my, my wife and I, it's Mr. Mr. and Mrs. David Burzens. That's who we are. We're one, per, one flesh. We become one flesh. And as much as I care about myself and my body, I should be caring about my wife and her body. And, you know, we become one and, and we're supposed to be a team. You know, husband and wife are supposed to be a team. You're supposed to be working together, not uh, in opposition to each other. Verse number 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself and wife, see that she reverence her husband. And after all those verses, it just, that last verse there just summarizes it and just says, this is what I'm talking about. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, reverence your husband. Reverence means revere. Hold in regard. This is also summarized. Turn, if you would, please, to 1 Peter, chapter number 3. Colossians, chapter 3, is kind of a parallel passage to Ephesians, chapter 5. Ephesians 5 goes into much more detail on this specific subject, but even in Colossians 3, verse 18, uh, this is summarized. The Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. So we get that added to the husbands loving your wives. Be not bitter. Don't hold grudges. Don't hold things over their head. When your wife makes a mistake, or at least you perceive your wife to make a mistake, she does something wrong, she's not submitting to your authority, don't let that become bitterness in your heart because it's going to be that much harder than to love your wife. <coughs> you cannot allow that stuff to linger. You have to learn to be able to forgive and move forward to continue loving your spouse. And this is, as far as I'm concerned, this is a commandment. You need to love your wife. So my wife's hard to love. Well, love her anyways. You picked her. Okay, you chose your wife. And that's, that's where you're at. So love her and, and learn to forgive and learn to move on. And it doesn't mean, now loving your wife doesn't mean that, well, she's not being submissive to me, so I'm just going to let her do all the rules. That's not love. You still need to be in charge. Loving doesn't mean letting your wife rule things. That's the way that you're going to get your house upside down and not in accordance to God's word. Loving is, no, we're going to do things the right way. I love you. I care about you. And in order for this thing to really work and have the best, most happy marriage we can have, let's both be in the roles that God gave us. Anytime you follow God's word, it's for your benefit. Every single time without fail, every single time, 100%. Yeah, all those commandments that tell you not to do things, you're going to be way better off if you don't do those things. All the commandments that tell you to do certain things, guess what? You're going to be way better off if you do those things. God designed us. God created us. God made the rules the way he wants us to follow them. If we can do our best and follow those rules, it's going to be the best for us. We receive the benefit. It's a good thing not to kill people. <laughs> you have a lot of bad consequences associated with that. It's a good thing not to steal from people. Okay, you may think, yeah, but I'm getting this stuff right now. Yeah, but it's going to come back and bite you. It's going to be worse for you. It's going to destroy your life even more. It's going to, it's going to be more harmful than whatever good you think you get by, by increasing this substance immediately in the short term. It's in the end, it's bad for you. And, and we can't be so short-sighted when it comes to the things of God and his commandments and what we're supposed to be doing as the thinking, well, no, 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 this, I know better. You don't know better than God. Trust him. Have faith in his word. Ladies, have faith in your husband that he can lead you. Let him do that. He's supposed to be loving you and caring for you and, and, and that's, the, that's what should be guiding his decision making, the word of God. But let him lead. Trust him. 1 Peter. 
So chapter number three starts off like this. It says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, again, we're starting off with the wives being in subjection. Okay, this, this theme, we're going to see this over and over again. Which is why I started off the sermon the way I did, because you need to understand, this is in Scripture. This is not my opinion. This is just what the Bible says, and we're going to see it over and over again. But before we even get into more of 1 Peter chapter 3, I want to go back to chapter 2, just because it starts off with that word likewise. So likewise means in the same manner, and it's referencing what was already written in the previous chapter. So to get these in context, um, I've mentioned this before, but it's important to understand, you know, the, the Bible chapters and verses, this isn't how the Bible was originally given to man. They were letters written. I mean, there, there are paragraphs. These are literally letters that were written. There was no division. Apostle Paul or whoever's writing down, penning down the words, they're not like putting, okay, number 19 and then writing a verse and then number 20. This is just for our benefit today to be able to reference things and, and say, hey, here's where I want you to look to. And it's really easy to do that with chapter and, and verse uh, divisions. So we understand that just because there's a chapter, it doesn't mean that it's not, you, you still need to get the context oftentimes with the whole letter, with the whole book, right? But, but definitely in context here with, with the associated chapters that are around it. And when this was uh, verse number one in chapter three starts off with likewise, well, let's get the context of that. So let's go back to chapter number two because chapter number two gives a lot of instruction on how believers ought to live, but it follows kind of a common theme. We're going to start reading here in verse number 13. The Bible says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. So basically it's saying, you know, just follow the laws. Just, just obey the laws, you know, for the Lord's sake. Just, just, you know, don't be some big troublemaker and have to go around and break all these laws. And stuff. Saying, just, just follow the laws of the land. You know, I take that to mean even if they're not like God's laws, but they're just stupid laws, he's like, just, just follow them. The governor, whatever, you know, that, that just, just obey these laws of the land. Verse 15 says, For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. So we understand the mindset already in chapter 2 that's just being given and being instructed, right? Just kind of have this humble mindset, you know, yeah, we know you're free, but don't use that for malicious intent. You know, we need to be able to put to silence ignorant, the foolish, ignorant men that want to just bring up any accusation against you. Oh, yeah, well, you, I've seen you. You break this law and break this law. It's foolish. But he's saying, you know what? Let's just avoid that. So if you, if you following some of these stupid laws can, can just avoid that, that ignorance of these foolish men. We can put the silence. Then verse number 17 says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. So this is talking about being a servant, serving somebody else, and the master being the boss. He saying when you go to work, when you have a boss, Servants, you know what? Be subject. Be in obedience. Be in submission. That's what subject means to your masters with all fear. It says not only to the good, not only to the good bosses, not the ones that treat you well and praise you and, and give you all the, the respect and everything else that you should be getting from a boss. He's saying, but also to the forward, to the mean ones, to the nasty ones. You know what? You work the same. Whether, what, however they respond to you, should not impact how you work and how you behave in your position. So if you got a mean, nasty boss, I'll say, well, well that's the way you're going to treat me, then this is the way I'm going to do my job. I'm just going to give you the bare minimum. You're going to pay me this amount and I'm not going to do any more than that. That is not a Christian attitude to have. That's not a biblical attitude to have. You're going to be representative of, of Jesus Christ here on earth and try to walk in his steps. You know what you do? You do your job. You do your job well. You do your job as if you're serving the Lord. And it doesn't matter if, you're, if your boss is mean to you or if your boss is nice to you. 
You do what you're supposed to do. Verse number 19, for this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you ta shall take it patiently, but if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. So basically he's saying this is thankworthy. This is good in the sight of the Lord if you endure things wrongfully. You endure grief. You endure suffering. You, you're persecuted. You have a bad boss. You have someone who's not treating you right. But if you could endure that patiently, the Bible says that's thankworthy. That's actually good. God appreciates that and respects that when you're doing what you're supposed to do. And then it's going to give us the rest of the chapter here. It's going to explain because that's how Christ was. That's the attitude that Jesus Christ had on this earth. Verse 21 says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. So when Jesus Christ, when people were, were bad-mouthing him, reviling him, saying all manner of evil against him falsely, did he fight back and say, oh yeah, well you know what, you're this and you're that. He didn't do that. He didn't give cursing for cursing. He didn't go and revile other people when they reviled him. He wasn't, he didn't have guile, he wasn't tricking people. When he suffered from other people, he didn't threaten them, oh yeah, well you know what I'm going to do to you. You know, as a son of God, I'm going to do this to you. I'm going to make sure that you suffer. He didn't do that, not once. But what he do is says he committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. So I'm going, to, I'm going to take it. I'm going to suffer it. I'm going to allow it and let God deal with it. That's the example that we have. Verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So all of this that we read here in, in chapter 2 has the same mindset, the same attitude of do what's right, be in your spot, be in your position, you know, submit yourself to the authority, and if people treat you bad, just keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. That's, that's the whole summary there we read in chapter 2. So as we go into chapter 3, verse number 1, likewise. So in that same manner, in that same spirit, in that same attitude, the way that Christ suffered for us. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. So he's saying in the same manner, wives, let's say you have a husband that doesn't obey the word. That's not a Christian. That doesn't live by the Bible. That's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. Does that change what you should do? No. In the same manner. Hey, Jesus wasn't treated the way that he should have been treated. The Son of God on this earth, was he treated right? He was spit on, beaten, whipped, crucified, mocked, ridiculed. But did he still do what he was supposed to do? Absolutely. He even still had the love in his heart to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's the attitude. This is a humble attitude. The lack of humility in marriages is one of the reasons why you see so many ending in divorce. It really is. You can't do that to me. The Bible says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the voice. You know what it's saying? Well, if you keep doing what's right, you know what? You still might win over your husband. Just by your actions. So it says there, your conversation. It's an older word. Words change meaning a little bit over time. This isn't just like, like you sitting down with someone and having a verbal conversation where you're talking about something the way that you might think about it. 
the conversation is basically the way that you present yourself. It, it's kind of your, your manner of being. So the way that a wife is being submissive to her husband at home. Yes, sir. Okay. And being humble. That goes a long way. It really does. When people can see that, that, that type of mindset and attitude that you're serving Christ and you can, you can have that humility. Verse 2, verse two, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. <clears throat> when they see that in you, something will reach into, you know, that, that'll have an impact. Way more of an impact than you trying to boss your husband around and tell them what to do and tell them what's right. Being in your role is going to speak volumes. As I mentioned before, your husband may not always be right. But they, and they may even do things that would cause you to suffer wrongfully. But the Bible teaches to endure because that's, that's what's right. Look at verse number three here. The Bible says, Who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold and of put, or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So now it's comparing, saying, don't be so worried about your outward appearance. Why do you know your adorning of, you know, plating the hair, wearing gold, putting on jewelry, putting on all this stuff to make your outside look really good and pretty. He's saying, focus on the, the inside, the hidden man of the heart, it says, and that which is not corruptible. And then it talks about ornaments, just like you would put on an ornament, like an earring or, or a ring or a necklace or something like that. The ornament that God wants, that God values, which says that is of great price in the sight of God. So when God's looking at a woman and he says, wow, that is an ornament that, that is of high value, that he sees as being real precious on a woman, it says it's the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Not a loud, stubborn, bossy spirit, a meek and quiet spirit. Humble, meek, and quiet. These aren't my words. You can, you can accept what this says and have a better marriage or you can reject this and go the way of the world. The choice is up to you. I mean, you, you do what you want to do, but I'm going to make sure that these words come loud and clear today and that everyone could hear and understand what this is saying. And you apply it to yourself the way that you, that you deem fit. Verse number five, for after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves. So now it's going to give us examples of women who were doing what was right. Saying this is the way that the women of old time did it. This is the spirit that they had, the meek and quiet spirit that they had, that God valued. It says, being in subjection under your own husband. Wow, there's that word, there's that phrase again. We seem to keep running across this. Maybe we should pay attention when we see a phrase reiterated over and over again throughout Scripture, not contradicting, but saying the same exact thing over and over again. Maybe we should let that sink in. And I think that the Bible talks oftentimes about things that maybe are more problems in general with our human nature is brought up more frequently because God knows we need to hear it more often than just one time. The Bible says in verse number six, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Sarah and Abraham, great example, husband and wife. Abraham loved his wife. And Sarah was submissive unto her husband. She respected him and his authority. And it says to the point where she called him Lord. Yes, my Lord. That's being praised. You say, oh, that's crazy. That's ridiculous. I couldn't imagine saying that to my husband. Well, Sarah's being used as the example of the godly woman who had the right level of respect. Now, we don't commonly use the word Lord just in our, in our 
American English vernacular. Maybe they do in UK. I don't know. But <laughs> not so much. Not as familiar. We, we, we've got uh, Brother Stephen here. <laughs> he, could, he could get me up to date on all the, the British terms. But um, what we do use is the word sir, right? That's a, that's a, a common word of respect because that's what Sarah's doing. She's, she's showing her respect to her husband as being her boss, her authority, and calling him Lord. It says, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. So the Bible's saying you can be just like Sarah. You can be daughters of Sarah in, in the way that if you behave that the way she behaved. Just like when Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees, they said, we're, we're, I don't know what you're talking about. We're children of Abraham, right? He said, if you were children of Abraham, you'd do the works of Abraham. The year of your children, the devil. The same way the Bible's saying here, you could, be, you could be daughters of Sarah. If you do just like she did, have the same level of respect that she had for her husband and wear that, that uh, adorning of a meek and quiet spirit. Verse number seven. Likewise, ye husbands dwell with them, who's them? The wives, according to knowledge giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. And see, this is a great verse for husbands not to let yourself get so lifted up in your authority that you mistreat your wife. Because the Bible says here, you need to give honor unto your wife. So yeah, husbands should be respecting their wives in the sense that they honor them, they love them, they're caring for them, they're going to provide for them. But it doesn't mean that they're in charge. That's the difference. I value my wife. I value my wife's opinions. But at the end of the day, you know, if, if I just did everything she said, then she would be the boss. I mean, I could say, well, I'm the head of the family. But if I just do everything that she says all the time, unless she's just always in agreement with me, then she's the one running the house and not me. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Yes, the Bible says as unto the weaker vessel. Women are physically weaker than men. It's a fact. Whether you want to accept it or not, it's a fact. And as being heirs together of the grace of life. So heirs together. That's not just your wife, but if, you know, if she's saved, that's your sister. You're heirs together of God's grace. You're in this together. You're a team. Don't forget that. Don't let all that, all that power in your home go to your head, right? And, you know, ladies, if you, if you think that it's that great to be the man... Because for whatever reason, the feminist movement wants to turn women into men. Right. I don't understand it yeah. at all because it, it is just weird. It's bizarre. Like the, the, the feminist movement tells, teaches women that basically you don't have any value unless you do things that a man does. That's crazy. Right. I would hate for my wife to be like me. I really would. <laughs> that would be horrible. <laughs> I love and appreciate the fact, you know what, it's much more valuable in our household that she can be in the role that she has with raising the children and doing those types of things and keeping the house and doing everything that she does is extremely valuable for our house to function and operate in the best possible manner. That's way better than if we're both going off to jobs. Because then who's going to be raising our children? What are they going to be receiving? We're going to have to send them off to be with somebody else. I don't want to do that. I care about my children. I care about my wife. My wife has a lot, quite a bit of freedom. I think she just went to the park the other day, and guess what? She didn't even tell me that she was going. <gasps> <laughs> Took the kids out. Imagine that. It's horrible. I know. Dictator Burzen, such, a, such an awful person that believes the Bible, and that, and, that, and that woman who's pregnant, barefoot, in the kitchen, making meals, you know, that horrible lifestyle, was able to just go out to the park and, and spend an afternoon with the kids. Don't be deceived by the, by the propaganda that the world's going to throw at you about how horrible of a life that would be. Oh, be in, submissive, in submission to your husband. 
One last aspect of marriage I want to cover because this came up in a news article. Turn, if you would, to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I just read this article literally yesterday. So this is, this is current news. And this has been current news for a long time because people are always trying to change laws. Laws that were actually established in truth. Laws that were actually established for a good reason. I'm not saying all laws were, were good and perfect and right, you know, just because maybe they're a little bit older. But this particular law, this, this, was, this has been part of common law, which is what the, the framework of, of our government here in the United States was based off of, English common law. And I read this article. So of course, it's an Associated Press article. It's an AP article. And it was entitled, Closing Loopholes in Marital Rape. It's kind of odd, but... I'm going to start reading the first two paragraphs of this article because this tells you exactly the mindset and the point of view where they're coming from. It starts off, the, the whole article starts off like this. Witches were still being burned at the stake when Sir Matthew Hale came up with his legal theory that rape could not happen within marriage. The 17th century English jurist declared it legally impossible because wedding vows implied a wife's ongoing consent to sex. Three and a half centuries later, vestiges of the so-called marital rape exemption or spousal defense still exist in most states. Remnants of the English common law that helped inform American legal traditions. Legislative attempts to end or modify those exemptions have a mixed record, but have received renewed attention in the Me Too era. As a society gets more and more backwards, and husbands and wives are pitted against themselves, and it's become just morally acceptable for people to just go ahead and get divorces. And by the way, tonight you can stick around. I'm preaching on biblical divorce as well. So we're teaching on biblical marriage this morning and biblical divorce tonight. But as things start going backwards and families split up more and more, well, it makes sense that people are going to be attacking even these types of laws. Now, you may not have ever even really thought about this that much before. I don't blame you. It's kind of a weird thing to really give a whole lot of thought to marital rape. But the concept, I believe marital rape is ridiculous. And that this concept that... You know, when, when witches were still being... You know what the Bible says? Suffer not a witch to live. That's what the Bible says. Oh, yeah, this horrible time when, when uh, witches were still being burned at the stake. Oh, you mean when people actually followed the Bible and had more respect to God's word? I think I'll probably go, will lean towards those laws when people had respect to the Bible more than anything else. But just the, the very beginning to tell you a little bit about the author of this article, anyone that starts off their opinion, because you know what that is? That's a mockery. That's a mockery of the Bible when they're bringing up witches being burned at the stake. That's what they're trying to do and say, this is so arcane and ridiculous. When people start off like that, I give zero consideration to the rest of what they have to say. Because if you're going to mock the Bible and mock God's word and, and say, oh, those, that's so ridiculous, or people always want to bring up, you know, you tell them a Christian, oh, the Salem witch trials and all this other stuff. Look, I don't know that much about the witch trials. And it probably was people just going overboard and not doing things lawfully and not doing things right. I don't know. That's, that's my understanding of it is that people were just being accused and there wasn't a lot of evidence and whatever else. But part of it is people just think it's ridiculous that a witch should be executed. And people scoff at that and mock that. Well, you know what? That's what the Bible says that the punishment should be. So I love God's word and I think God's law is perfect. And just because you might not think that a witch should be put to death, I think they should. Just like I think an adulterer should be put to death. Just like I think that a person who steals another person, a kidnapper, should be put to death. Just like I believe that a person who forces someone else, a rapist, should be put to death. Just like I think that a sodomite ought to be put to death because all of those things are things that the Bible says should have the death penalty. I believe that. Yes, I believe a witch should be put to death too. And if someone enforced the law improperly, it doesn't change whether or not the law is right and good. People could misenforce the law all day long. 
and not do it right and not and not do due diligence and allow for for judges to have you know tainted minds and and not do things the way that they ought to be doing like they're executing god's law that doesn't change what's right and true if people do bad things but in first corinthians chapter 7 it's very clear what the bible teaches about this subject this marital rape issue because it's really a non-issue. Because Sir Matthew Hale, that came up with his legal theory, was right. He was right. There is consent when you make that marriage vow. That's one of the things you're consenting to. And not just to the vows, but according to Scripture. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 1. The Bible reads, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So right off the bat, he's saying, you know what? It's good for a man not to touch a woman. Said, That's what's right. You're not married. Don't be touching women. But if you, don't, if you want to avoid fornication, which is having that physical relationship, then you get married. Why? Because when you get married, that's when you have that physical relationship. He's saying it's much better to do that. Verse number three, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. Benevolence is, means you love your wife, right? And likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. <coughs> Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves a fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency." What the Bible is saying here is that in this regard, so we already went over how the husband is the head of the house, right? He's the boss. He makes the rules. When it comes to his body, though, he's not in charge. Right. Same way with the wife. That's what the Bible is teaching here is that she doesn't have power over her own body. The husband does. The husband has the power over his own body. The wife does. This is an aspect, an area of marriage that basically, according to Scripture, if one person wants to come together and have that relationship, then, then you should be having that relationship. And that's the bottom line, because that's where the authority lies in being able to have that relationship. And that's another reason why a lot of marriages fail, because that relationship ceases. And that's an important relationship to have. And, that's, and the Bible says here, now, what does it mean to, to be a fraud? It means you're misrepresenting, right? Like if, you, if, if I'm going to fraud someone out of some money, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell them one thing, but I'm lying to them. I'm, I'm not telling the truth. And, you know, I'm stealing from them, whatever. Being a fraud is, is putting up a front and saying you're something that you're not. You're committing fraud. Well, the Bible says to defraud ye not one another. So when you withhold yourself from that relationship in a marriage, you're defrauding your spouse. Now, how is that fraud? Because they should have the right to have that relationship. And you've already said that you've committed to have that relationship with your husband when you got married or with your wife, whatever, your spouse. So when you withhold, you're defrauding the other person. He says, don't do that. Don't defraud one another. And get this, because, you know, everyone says, well, no, whether, whether it's inside marriage or outside marriage, everything has to be consensual. Well, the Bible says that when you withhold the relationship, that's when it has to be with consent. So not to have that relationship, that's not requiring of consent, because the consent was already given. It's when you both decide, okay, we're going to abstain, we're going to withhold, we're both agreeing to this. That's when it's acceptable. And it says, except to be with consent for a time. And then here's the purpose for that. That you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Because when you fast, you're afflicting yourself. So he's saying, we're going to withhold this pleasure and, and go, give ourselves over into fasting and prayer. We're going to dedicate to God for this set amount of time. And we're going to withhold having that relationship consensually. And then come together again 
that Satan tempt you not. The adulterous relationships happen oftentimes when this relationship has ceased in the home, in, in the marriage. Because Satan has tempted them for their incontinency. This is all, what, this is what the scripture says. Again, I'm not just making things up here. It's not Pastor Burson's crazy ideas. This is what 1 Corinthians 7 teaches. So, I, 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 like I said, it, it still goes along with marriage. And I, I think it's important, a very important aspect to have that relationship. That's why, that's why people get married. You avoid fornication. Do it the right way. Get a spouse. Now, all of that being said, it doesn't mean that, that the husband should be... I don't think that, that it's right to have one person just really being you know, violent or forceful and things like that. That's not what I'm saying. Obviously, if a husband loves his wife, it's not going to be what, what image conjures up in your mind when you hear the word rape, right? That, that's not, that's, that's not going to be the way things are. And that's not the way things should be ever. So don't think I'm just condoning of you know, bad behavior. But just, I mean, even just legally speaking, though, and what the Bible says, this is, there, there's not a, having that relationship together is something that, that is bound in marriage. And that that's, um, you know, you, you can't go back and withdraw consent. So, um, anyways, that's, that's kind of what's going on in, in the world today. But so many people are so screwed up and, and have gone so far away from what Scripture says that they they're going to look at me and say, that, you're crazy. Very simple message as far as what the Bible teaches on husbands and wives. Very simple, very rudimentary. Simple as far as being not complicated. Not necessarily simple in carrying out. I understand that. But it's not complicated. Thank God, it's, it's pretty easy to understand. Husbands, love your wives. Be not bitter against them. Love them as their own bodies. Give honor unto them as unto the weaker vessel. Benevolence, love them. And wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands. Be obedient, be respectful. Pretty simple. God makes things easy for us. Put those things into action, and I guarantee your marriage will improve. Guaranteed. Spot Rides have a word of prayer. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us the instruction that, that we need as your creation, as your creatures, Lord. I pray that you please help us to um, have a soft humble heart that's that's ready to accept uh, your words and to apply them in our own lives lord i pray that you would please just work in the the lives and the marriages of the the husbands and wives here i pray that you would please help the the people who are not married that might be married one day to to learn these great truths and um be able to apply them from the very beginning of their marriages lord and um i pray that you would I, we thank you again for giving us the information that we need and I pray that you please just give us the strength and the humility to be able to, um, to do what's right in the sight of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.